Dave, I've always been fascinated by the concept of existence. And when I think about existence, what that means, I'm always back to consciousness. But then I see some philosophers telling me that consciousness is an illusion, doesn't really exist. Do you think otherwise? I think consciousness is the thing we know about more directly than we know about anything in the world. Hmm. You know, the great philosopher Descartes said, we can doubt the existence of anything in the world. I could doubt that you exist. Maybe this is just a dream. I could doubt that any of the tables and chairs around us exist. I could maybe even doubt the existence of my own body. But the one thing I can't doubt is that I'm yeah. conscious yeah. right now. You know, I think, I am conscious, therefore I am. My consciousness is presented to me more directly than anything else in the world. If this is an illusion, then the illusion is consciousness. Uh, some say, okay, that's Descartes, they ridicule him, they say now that we know about the brain, we know how the neurons work, the spites of activity, the synapses, the chemical compositions, the complexity, that out of that complexity of 100 billion neurons and trillions of connections, consciousness can emerge. Still an illusion. Maybe consciousness emerges from something else. I mean, this is a further question downstream, but the number one datum of the science of consciousness and the philosophy of consciousness is there is consciousness. Now, is it a primitive? Is it the first element of reality? Or is it something derivative? Is it sort of a second element of reality that somehow emerges from the brain? Well, that's an open question, at least at the beginning of the discussion. But you can't question that consciousness exists. Well, you can question that, that I think consciousness exists and that I seem to, to have a, a focal point, but you can show that uh, 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 activity at the brain stem, so-called reticular activating system, makes you focus on visual things or auditory things. So, you know, you think you're this unified consciousness, but really you have these streams of, of, of data that you're focusing on, and that's all it is. I tell you what, I can question your consciousness. I can't be 100% certain that you are conscious right now. Maybe you're just like acting conscious and walk, you're walking the walk, you're talking the talk. Maybe nothing's going on in there. Maybe you're a zombie. <laughs> I can't question my consciousness. I'm experiencing, I'm experiencing it directly. All right, it's more real to me than anything else. Tell me about zombies. You've really had a major impact in the philosophy of mind by talking about zombies. It's a funny word, but there's some significance there. Well, there's a lot of kind of zombies, you know. Um, there's the zombies in the, uh, the Hollywood movies. I guess they're, uh, I guess they're dead yeah. and they come back to life. And then there's your Haitian zombies. I guess they've had some kind of voodoo poison, they lack some kind of free will. Yeah. But the zombies that philosophers are concerned with, they're just like you and me, but they lack consciousness. They walk around acting like a conscious being, talking like a conscious being, but they're not conscious. You stick them with the pin, they say, ow. Exactly. And you ask them, are you conscious? They say yes. <laughs> and no one thinks zombies actually exist. I mean, I'm not a zombie, I don't think you're a zombie. But we can at least make sense of the idea. They, they seem to at least be imaginable. You know, you say, could God have created a world with zombies? To use a metaphor here for a second. It seems like God could have done that. Our world is not a world of zombies. We're not robots. We're not automata. We're conscious. That itself is something that needs explanation. It, 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 so the fact that, it, that you can conceive of a zombie means that there is a possibility of something else being needed to differentiate us from a zombie? I would say that when God created the world, the, he could have created a purely physical world, just atoms in the void, no consciousness at all. That would have made sense. That's a logically consistent world. Our world isn't like that. Our world contains consciousness. That suggests that when God created the world, he had to do some more work. He had to put consciousness in. Now, subtract God from the metaphor <laughs> now and just use this as a way of thinking about what exists in the world. You need the matter, then you need the consciousness. Okay, now evolutionary theory would say, particularly evolutionary psychology, that during an evolutionary process, consciousness somehow came in, it was selected for, because if we have an awareness in our environment, we can avoid the tigers a little better, maybe plant the crops better, who knows what, but consciousness was a selected factor, maybe it emerged at random, and then developed. Well, it sounds plausible on the face of it that consciousness plays some role in evolution. The fact is, any story anyone's ever told about the evolutionary story role of consciousness has been quite obscure and uh, doesn't really quite make sense. The trouble is anything you want evolution to explain, how we react, what we say, and so on, 
I can find some explanation for how that happens that goes wholly in terms of mechanisms, algorithms in the brain, uh -huh. and so on. Once I, sp once I spell out that story, we say, why do you need consciousness for that? So the evolutionary story could have worked with just r r reflexes, maybe higher level reflexes, but same reflexes, but no inner experience. A really complicated inner computer, uh -huh. really complicated uh -huh. inner mechanisms. Computers are getting better and better, and maybe one of these days they're going to be able to do all the things that we can do. But then the question is, why do you need consciousness? Okay, now this brings up the word that philosophers use, qualia. What's qualia? Qualia is the raw sensation of experience. So I look around me and I see colors, reds and greens and blues, and they feel a certain way to me. I hear the sound of music, a far off clarinet in the distance, the smell of mothballs. <laughs> All of these feel a certain way to me. They have a quality of experience, and you've got to experience them to know what they're like. I mean, I could, you could give me the whole map of my brain, what's going on when I see colors, when I smell mothballs, and so on. But if I haven't seen a color for myself, that's not going to tell me about the quality of seeing red, of seeing green, smelling the mothballs. You actually have to experience it for yourself. You've talked about a uh, advanced scientist who is colorblind but knows every wavelength of every color. And what happens when she finally sees color? Yeah, so Mary, the famous uh, colorblind neuroscientist, <laughs> spends her entire life in a black and white room. She's never seen a color, but she learns everything there is to know about the neuroscience of color. The wavelength of the light, the neurons that fire in response, the behavior it gives rise to. She can tell you all about red and green and blue. There's one incredibly important thing about color she just doesn't know. She doesn't know what it's like to see red, to see green. She doesn't know about the conscious experience of red and green. All the, bre the brain science in the world isn't going to tell her that. Imagine one day she has an operation. She leaves her room. She says, ah, that's it. <laughs> that's what it's like to see red. She's, so she's learned something new about consciousness. What follows from that? That, to me, suggests that there's more to consciousness than a physical process in the brain. Because you could know all there is to know about the physical processes in the brain, and you wouldn't know all there is to know about consciousness. You've become quite well known for defining the easy problem and the hard problem. Go for it. So there's a lot of things we want to explain when we explain consciousness. People use the word in lots of different ways. You might want to explain things like how it is that my brain perceives something in the environment. And a stimulus is my retina, my brain integrates information, I react, I point, I say something. Maybe you could give an explanation of those things in terms of circuits in my brain, or algorithms in my brain, but those are just the easy problems of consciousness. Now we say easy, they're really hard, but, but relatively easy. I'd say, you know, a good century or two yeah, of more yeah. and more ingenious right. brain science right. is going to get us there. We're going to isolate the right. neural circuits, the computational mechanisms that make us behave the way we behave, do the things we do. The hard problem of consciousness is why is all that processing accompanied by conscious experience? Why does it feel like something from the inside? Why do we have this amazing inner movie going on? in our minds all the time. And it looks like all the whole story you tell about neural circuits and computational mechanisms, it just leaves that question out. Take a thousand years into the future at the same rapid growth of science, a hundred thousand years, a million years. Do you see in principle, can the hard problem as you've defined it be subject to neuroscience analysis? I don't think the hard problem of consciousness can be solved purely in terms of neuroscience. I think neuroscience has a huge contribution to make to its solution. But if we just stay with the level of neurons and processing alone, there's only so much that's going to explain. Because neurons and neuroscience is all about objective mechanisms. Objective mechanisms that perform functions that ultimately issue in behavior. So if you want to say explain language, explain perception, explain memory, the things we do, the functions of the brain, that's just fine. But it just explains those functions, those behaviors. And that always leaves this further question. Why is that behavior, those functions, accompanied by consciousness? For that, we need an extra ingredient in the picture, I think. We need to bring in consciousness itself, on my view. It's fundamental. Where do we go from there? If we agree with that, how can you make a next step? In science, we're used to the idea that we explain some things 
in terms of other things. Say we explain biology in terms of physics. We explain molecules in terms of atoms. But we take some things as fundamental. You know, space and time. We don't explain them in terms of more primitive things. Yeah. Well, we needn't. We just can take space or time as fundamental. Mass or charge as fundamental. My own view is that's the attitude we have to take to consciousness. Don't try to reduce consciousness to some more basic thing. Say it's just a process in the brain. Say that consciousness is a fundamental property of the universe in the way that space and time and mass are. Once you've done that, you can build a fantastic science of consciousness in the way that we've developed a science of space and time and mass. Most people tend to think that the world is divided between scientists who are materialists who only see the physical world and theologians or theists or people who believe in religion who see God or some higher power involved and that's the dichotomy of the world. It's one way or, or the other. Uh, posing consciousness in there kind of disturbs this dyadic two-part picture. I think consciousness is something that everyone should believe it. It's not this science versus consciousness. If you're a good scientist, you have to explain the data. And one of the most fundamental data of our existence is the fact that we're consciousness, that we're conscious. If you leave that out of your picture, you just haven't, ex haven't started to explain one of the first things that needs explaining. So following good scientific principles, I think we need to expand our theories to let consciousness into the picture. And if that expands our science a little bit, from the purely materialistic science with which we started. Well, okay, we, we got there by following good scientific principles, just trying to build an adequate theory of the world that we're confronted with.